This took place during the early 1990s. I was 10 or 11 at the time. My family and I lived in a rural area near Kansas City. This particular area is very different nowadays compared to what it was in the 90s. Back in the day, it had a very country-like atmosphere. We lived off of a gravel road, and traffic was very sporadic. Typically, the only people who drove down our road were the people who lived there, and there were only a few houses on our street at the time. Across the street from the house that we moved into was a cornfield with a few trees beside the road. There were a couple of boys my age who lived in the same neighborhood, and we all thought it would be fun to build a treehouse or a fort of some kind. I was across the street almost every day. My friends would usually walk to my house, and then we would go across the street to play in the fort. Think of that scene in the 1990 miniseries of Stephen King's It, where the Losers Club was building that dam in the river outside of Derry. Yep, it was a lot like that. One day, I was across the street with one of the other boys. We noticed a small blue car driving up and down the street, slowly. Since our road was very narrow and gravelly, it wasn't unusual for cars to drive down it slowly. But this car in particular was driving extremely slow. I noticed that the driver would look out his window and sort of eyeball us every time that he drove by. I saw him at least two or three more times that afternoon. I remember thinking that he was probably curious about our playhouse, or that he was lost and was contemplating on asking us for directions. After a while, my friend had to take off, leaving me there all by myself. Not long after my friend had left, I saw that same blue car driving down our street once again, but this time he came to a stop. The driver just sat there and stared at me for a while and I got this uneasy feeling about him. Even at that age, I knew all about stranger danger. I began to feel like something bad was going to happen. I could hear my dad's words echoing in my head. If a stranger tries to grab you, you run as fast as you can and scream your head off. I started thinking about which direction to run off to. I knew that if I ran off in the opposite direction, that I would be running into a cornfield that was at least a mile wide in every direction. If I ran towards my house, I would have to cross the street, meaning that I would have to pass the creepy guy in the car. The situation terrified me, and I could feel my heart beat escalating as I decided what the hell I should do. While deciding which direction will give you my best chance of escaping, I saw the guy reach down for something. I never saw what he was reaching for, but something told me that if I didn't take off in that moment, I would be history. I then saw the driver's side door open just a crack. I knew that my dad was home at the time, so I decided to make a break for it. I knew that I was going to have to cross the street and make it past the man's car. So I began running as fast as I could alongside the road opposite of where the man's car was facing. I could see out of the corner of my eye that the man had closed his driver's side door. When I got to the road, the driver put his car in reverse. If I had been a second slower, I wouldn't have made it. The trunk of his car barely missed me as I darted across the street and into my driveway. I began screaming as loud as I could as I ran towards my house. My dad immediately came outside and met me in the driveway. When I turned around to show my dad the man in the car, he was gone. All I could see was a cloud of dust rising off the gravel road as the man in the blue car sped out of there. That night I had a nightmare. I was running down a seemingly endless gravel road, panting, sweating, terrified. I will look back to see a blue car getting closer and closer. I woke up my parents. Apparently I had been yelling in my sleep. I had to sleep in their room for a while, but eventually the night terrors did stop. This happened nearly two decades ago, but I can still remember it very well. I have no doubt in my mind that the man in the blue car was the monster that your parents would tell you about when you were a kid. Had I not ran off when I did, I would likely be nothing but a statistic today. I would occasionally hear stories about other kids who went missing in my area during the 90s, and I would often wonder if the man in the blue car had anything to do with it. 
but now I understand why my dad always told me to run and scream. And someday, I'll be instructing my own kids to do the same. I had always been told that it was never a good idea to go to the local park at night. I've heard many stories about that place, ranging from homeless people getting into loud altercations to bystanders being assaulted and even robbed. I have to admit that I didn't take these stories seriously and would often go to the park after dark. Normally I would walk through the park after finishing my lifeguard shift at the community pool. It was a part of my routine and it always seemed like I was the only one there. Whenever I would make my way through the park, I always noticed the unmistakable smell of marijuana, even though no one was in sight. It was a bit odd, but I brushed it off, not really giving it much thought. On the night in question, I was casually strolling through the park and was approaching the area where I would usually smell the cannabis, and I saw a tall silhouette trailing behind me. I couldn't tell if the figure was a man or a woman because of the distance, but I was creeped out nonetheless. I then saw that the assailant was wearing a V4 Vendetta mask, a short skirt, and was brandishing a knife. At this point, my heart was pounding. I then heard the masked figure let out an agonizing scream. The scream didn't sound like it was a female. It sounded like a deranged man. Regardless of what this person identified as, they were wearing a mask and holding a knife and screaming like a fucking psychopath. And I assumed the worst. I bolted, running faster than I ever had in my life. The figure gave chase, picking up their pace once I started running. Once I got to the front door of my house, I nervously fiddled through my pockets, trying to look for my keys. I was in too much panic that I realized that I left my keys in my backpack. I eventually gave up trying to find the keys and started pounding on the door loudly. My dad got angry when he heard the racket, but he understood my sense of urgency once I explained things to him. I can unequivocally say that the 30 seconds I spent waiting by my front door was the longest 30 seconds of my life. I should have listened to the warnings about walking through that park at night. A lesson lived is a lesson learned. This happened back in October of 2016, at the height of the killer clown craze that was going on back then. At the time, I thought nothing of it. It was just a bunch of teenagers looking for a quick laugh by frightening others. I lived alone in a two-story house. There's about a three-mile walk between the neighboring houses. It's all separated by tall grass and forest. This detail will be important later on. Halloween night came around, and I was watching Friday the 13th in the living room. The front of the house has a large window overlooking the lawn. It was about 10.55 when Mrs. Voorhees was getting her head chopped off in the film, and that's when I heard a small but noticeable knock at the window. It made me jump a bit. What the hell? I went over to the window and pulled the curtains back, but all I could see outside was darkness. Ten minutes later, I'm getting ready for bed when I hear a knock at the front door. Now the front door has these long panels of blurred glass. I looked through and saw nothing but darkness. However, a red object appeared in the corner. Wondering what it could be, I changed my angle of view. And I kid you not, there was a fucking clown standing adjacent to my front door, staring right back at me. I jumped back in surprise as the clown fully pressed his face up to the glass. <laughs> I saw that the clown had a knife in his hand. I grabbed my cell phone to dial 911. And that's when he started pounding on the glass. Hard enough to eventually break it. I ran up the stairs, locked my bedroom door, and got ready to call the police. 
when an incoming call came in from my closest neighbor. Now the phone service in my area is pretty bad. The two bedrooms and the bathroom in my house are the only places that you can get good service. I answered the phone, but I couldn't make out anything that my neighbor was saying. His voice was coming in patchy and glitchy. He apparently was in a bad spot for phone service. He said something along the lines that someone just broke into his house. The call then disconnected. I quickly dialed 911 and told him what was going on. As I was on the phone, I heard the shattering of glass from downstairs. The dispatch informed me to stay locked in the room until the police came. <laughs> I then heard footsteps coming up my stairs, shortly followed by pounding on my bedroom door. That went on for what felt like hours until I heard police sirens outside. The clown then shouted in a creepy, strained voice. Oh, you fucker. You just wait. A flurry of footsteps descended the stairs and out the back door. I came out of the room and met with the officers. I explained everything to them and how I had received an odd phone call from my neighbor. As I was talking to the officers, my neighbor actually came over. What he told us shocked me. He said that when he called me before, he was trying to warn me that a clown had broken into his house and ran off in the direction of my house. The good news is that the cops ended up catching the clown during their search of the backyard. They brought him around front and placed him into one of the cruisers. They said that they found two kitchen knives and a loaded Glock 17 on him. The scariest thing about this encounter is how the clown got to my house so quickly without a vehicle. He left my neighbors at 11.03 and got to my house at 11.05. The next day I got a bunch of texts from an unknown number saying that I was going to die. Since the perpetrator was locked up at this time, I'm guessing that it was an acquaintance of his, which makes me wonder if he acted alone that night. Nothing has happened since, but one thing is for sure. I fucking hate clowns. This happened back in 2012 when I was still attending college. Me and a few friends of mine opted to band together and rent out a one bedroom apartment near the campus. We were a bunch of party animals back then and we wanted our own place so we could indulge in that lifestyle without worrying about our parents or the school's administration. The apartment complex was located in a rather unsavory part of town. The cops were called out there at least once a week to break up fights or to respond to reports of break-ins. All we ever did there was shower and sleep. Having to overhear domestic disputes and arguing through the walls was just part of the deal. One night my roommates went to a party while I stayed behind to study for an upcoming exam. Aside from some Tupac playing somewhere in the upper levels, Things were pretty quiet. It was around 11 p.m. when I heard a strange sound coming from the hallway outside the front door. It sounded like a large metal object being dragged across the concrete floor. There was also a muffled noise, like someone was saying something, although I couldn't quite make out any words. This went on for about 10 minutes before there came a loud smashing sound. It was at this point that I got up and made my way over to the peephole. At first I didn't see anything, so I just waited to see if anyone would pass by my door. About a minute later, a figure came into view and stood between my door and the door opposite. It was a Caucasian male. Now, I will list three things that instantly made every alarm bell on my head go off. The man wasn't wearing a shirt and was completely drenched in sweat. There was a large axe in the man's right hand that he was dragging behind him. And last but not least, this deranged individual had on a black leather gas mask that completely hid his face. I was awestruck. This is the kind of thing that you see in low-budget horror movies. 
This kind of shit doesn't happen in real life. It was a complete shock to the system. As if reading my mind, a creepy, muffled voice then began singing. Come with me, Hail Mary, run quick see. What do we have here now? Do you wanna ride or die? La da 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 la 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 la. As soon as the man finished the verse, he lifted his left leg and heaved the axe into my door. The movement was so fast, it caused me to topple backward. As soon as I scrambled to my feet, I heard another voice from further down the hallway. Hey, what the fuck are you doing? I rushed back to the peephole. The masked man was now gone. To the left of my front door was a fire escape, where he was able to make a quick getaway. I then saw the apartment security guard step into view with his taser drawn. Hey, do you want me to call the police? I shouted through the door. Yeah, if you don't mind. I'm going back outside to cut him off. I immediately called the police and explained the situation to them. Unfortunately, the masked man managed to evade both the security guard and the police. The complex was surrounded by a small forest, and there was just too many ways for him to escape. After the lease was up, I moved out of that hellhole. A lunatic pacing up and down the hallway outside my door, wearing a gas mask and dragging an axe behind him while singing a creepy-ass rendition of a Tupac song was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was a terrifying experience, but I can look back on it now and laugh. I hope you've enjoyed my story, and stay safe out there, guys. This happened to me when I was in fourth grade. I am now 42. The internet as we know it wasn't around back in those days. So unfortunately, I don't have any news articles to corroborate my story. But I have a very vivid memory of what happened that day. The day that my friend nearly lost her innocence and possibly her life. Here is the backstory. I have always had this very weird habit that I still do to this very day. I don't know what causes it, but I've always walked on my tiptoes. When I would go to school, I would usually get picked on a lot for this. No matter how much I tried walking flat-footed, I always ended up back on my toes. This led my family to believe that I was destined to be a ballet dancer. As much as I loved to dance, I was also a tomboy that preferred climbing trees to wearing dresses. So when my mother, who worked two jobs, took me to the community center and signed me up for ballet classes, I thought I would definitely have to learn how to like dresses. The dance instructor's name was Mulaney. She was impressed by my skills, but wasn't crazy about my height or my parents' economic status, as this was a very expensive class. At the end of my audition, I was told that I was too tall and awkward. It was a nice way of building up a young girl's confidence. When I exited the classroom and entered the hallway, I heard Mulaney say under her breath, that she would not teach poor kids. I stopped mid-stride and turned around. Excuse me? And that's when she replied, I don't teach trailer trash, okay? My face became so red that my ears were purple. At that moment, I decided that I would knock her on her pompous ass. Before I could react, that's when I felt a hand on my shoulder, followed by a man's voice. That's a fighter in you. Have you ever thought about trying out karate? Mr. Diaz was a well-known and respected karate instructor in our county. He wanted me to try out his class and even offered to take me in at no charge. I would be his first girl, but he saw my potential, and I still owe him a lot for this. When I first started training, he noticed my tiptoed footing, and rather than mock me for it, he showed me how to turn them into weapons, as my legs are, to this day, still solid muscle from my calves to my thighs, and I kick harder than a mule. 
It was around this time that our small town on the coast of North Carolina was being terrorized by a man who had been abducting young girls. He would take them, have his way with them, and when he was done, he would bind their hands together, blindfold them before crossing into another town and dropping them off in the middle of the night. He was a sick bastard. He didn't kill any of his victims, but his M.O. suggested that he was becoming more and more violent with each incident. Mr. Diaz changed his lessons for a week or two and taught us how to use our momentum against attackers to get away. Eyes, nose, groin, and face. He said that if you were attacked, we should try our best to claw and scratch their face and eyes. Not only would this have the chance of blinding them, but it would also make them easy to identify after the fact. More importantly, he emphasized the buddy system. He told us not to screen the R word, because unfortunately while many people want to stop that from happening, he also said people don't want to see it, and carry that mental image around in their heads. We should scream, fire, or I lost my arm. He said that as silly as the last one sounds, it works. People are compelled to look at a fire, but even more so if someone's arm is falling off. Okay, so now on to the day in question. I was in fourth grade, and the year was 1990, springtime. At the time, I was with my best friend, who we'll call Ginny. Ginny and I decided to take a little walk around the neighborhood we lived in. This neighborhood had two main entrances, and formed a circle with two parallel streets in the middle. Homes were lined along each road, no more than one and a half acres apart, some even closer. It was very easy to come into one entrance, leave out the other, and not be seen by anyone, even if you were paying attention to the vehicles that were passing through. This was also back when we kept the time by looking at the streetlights. The rule was when the streetlights come on, your ass better be on your way home. Ginny and I were on the main road heading towards the back. We were just being a couple of young girls talking about boys that we liked and the boogeyman that had been terrorizing our state. A girl that we knew named Kelly had been the latest victim. She was turned from a social butterfly into a psych ward irregular. She even tried to take her own life at one point. As we were talking about this, I remember looking over my shoulder and seeing an unfamiliar car approaching us very slowly. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. The car was a Pontiac, with a faded maroon or burgundy color. The driver almost reminded me of Jeffrey Dahmer. He wore these thick, red-rimmed glasses, had tight blonde, curly hair, and had a smile that made my skin crawl. His window was down already, and he stopped the car beside us. Hello, girls. I'm trying to pay my electric bill, and I can't seem to find the office anywhere. Can you tell me how to get there from here? Coincidentally, the one electric company in our town wasn't even a mile away from our neighborhood. In fact, I could have walked straight through the woods and shown up at the front doorstep. The only way to pay to turn on the service was in the office itself. Again, this was a small town back in the early 90s. The driver continued, saying that he had to get there to avoid his electricity shutting off. Knowing that he had had to have been there before, I stated, It's where you paid to have it turned on, so just go there. That's when I noticed an open map beside him on the passenger seat. He explained that his mother had been the one to turn on the electricity, and he was new to the area, and had just come back from deployment. Something that struck me as odd was that his hair was a bit too long for being in the military, and he didn't have a sticker for getting on base. There are two military bases by us, Camp Lejeune and Cherry Point. Both of my grandfather served in the military. Uh, can you please just show me it here on the map? He beckoned Jenny over to his car. Jenny was obviously unaware that something was off. I looked around, and saw that no one was outside, and I quickly turned my attention back to Jenny and the man. The voice of Mr. Diaz echoed in my head. 
Fight if you can't fly. Something bad will happen to Jenny if you don't. As soon as Jenny gets close enough, a look of pure evil forms on the man's face. Imagine seeing a human transforming into a demonic creature. That's the best way I can describe it. Thanks, sweetie. Just point it out for me right here. He locks eyes with mine and gives me a sickly smile. That's when I quickly grab Jenny. Wait! Don't lean in! <coughs> Jenny's scream echoed across the street. As I look up and saw that the man had reached over the passenger seat and had a hold of her arm. The car slowly began to roll forward as he struggled to pull her in. I yelled as I wrapped my arms around Jenny's upper body. I then pulled back as hard as I could, and I knew it was going to hurt like a bitch once I fell onto the asphalt, but that was okay, as long as I still had a hold of Jenny. We both hit the road, and it hurt like hell, as I predicted. By this time, some of the neighbors heard us screaming, and had exited their homes. I pulled Jenny to safety as the car peeled away. One of the bystanders was the mother of my friend Brandon. She got the tags, and a detailed description of what the driver looked like, and his car. The man that we encountered that day was the monster who had been preying on young girls in North Carolina. I don't recall his name. My mother made every effort to keep me sheltered before this incident, and it just got worse after this. Now that I'm a mother myself, I can understand better now. She was proud of me and my actions that day. Jenny was also very grateful, and I'm glad to say that she's still doing well. The girl that I mentioned earlier, Kelly, serves as an example of what could have became of her if I hadn't intervened that day. Kelly has had a rough life and doesn't really speak to anyone anymore. I don't know all the details, but the monster ended up being caged. The descriptions of the car and the driver gathered from my neighborhood aided in his apprehension. I often think back to that day at the community center, where I was scoffed at by someone who thought I wasn't worth the investment. But against all odds, Mr. Diaz saw the potential in a tall, awkward girl who walked on her tiptoes. He was the guiding voice in my head that day, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been able to save Jenny. This took place when I was only seven years old. Back then, my parents would always drop me off at my grandma's house on the weekends. I always looked forward to staying with her. We would always go for walks around the neighborhood and talk to the people that she knew. My grandmother was always a very religious person, and we went to church with many of the people in her neighborhood. It was a very friendly community. They would often host garage sales on the weekends during the warmer months which usually had decent turnouts. On one weekend, my parents decided to go to one of the garage sales with us. I was super excited. We usually just liked to look around and rarely would buy anything. Eventually, we got to a house that had boxes of toys lined all the way down the driveway. The sale was happening at a house that we had never been to before, and we didn't know who lived there. Once I saw all the toys... I thought I had just won the lottery. While I was busy sorting through the newly discovered treasure, my grandma and parents were a few yards away looking at some dishes and furniture and making conversation with some of the other people there. An older man, who looked to be around 60, approached me and watched me sort through the boxes with a smile on his face. My, what a pretty young woman you are. Do you like toys? I eagerly said yes, not thinking anything of it. I was about to leave to go ask my mom if I could buy a toy horse that I found. But before I could go, he said that he would let me have it for free and gave it to me with a grin on his face. He started picking a few other toys out of the boxes and handing them over to me, insisting that I could have all the toys I wanted. He told me that he had way more toys inside of his house that I could play with as well. 
and that I should go with him. Before I knew it, I was being led into his house. My mom then came up behind me and pulled me away from him, and then asked what the hell was going on. She was furious, holding me tightly and staring daggers at the man. She must have seen what was happening just in time and intervened. My dad and grandma were right behind her. The man said nothing while my mom and grandma started screaming at him. And this caught the attention of every other bystander, and everyone was immediately suspicious. I don't remember what was said, because my dad scooped me up in his arms and took me back to the car. I remember my grandma calling the police before we left. I didn't understand the gravity of the situation at the time. I found out many years later that the man had gone to the same church as my grandma and had participated in a lot of the events hosted by the church, including the youth events. Apparently, the police found loads of child pornography on his computer and was sent to prison shortly after. I'm 19 now, and it still creeps me out thinking about what could have happened to me if my mother didn't see what was going on. Thank God she did. Back in 2001, I worked for a major home improvement warehouse. Let's just say the company I worked for had a thing for the color orange. By then, I had been with the company for about eight years. My previous position was with HR, an assistant to the regional and store managers. The company eliminated that position, so I asked to be transferred to the RTV department, which stands for Return to Vendor. The girl who was working in that position gave her two weeks notice, so the timing was perfect. The job was to work with the different vendors to get credit back to the store for defective merchandise. Our company had a pretty liberal return policy back in 2001, and some people brought back some strange things like garbage disposal units infested with maggots, old plug-in drills that weren't even being manufactured, you could always tell by the serial numbers, defective lawnmowers, and half-put-together shelves. I've seen it all. My RTV cage, as they called it, was located in the receiving department at the back of the store. It was a 12-foot-high chain-link fence with a swinging door entrance, which I would lock when I would go on lunch break or checked out for the day. I had my computer up on a makeshift stand, where I would process the credits and have vendors sign off on them. You wouldn't be able to see into the cage from outside due to all the bins holding the defective merchandise. One day, a vendor came in for some defective molding. I was standing at my computer with my back towards the guy as he inspected the merchandise, both the product and mine, apparently. He then told me, I'll give you credit for everything here. I was about to turn around and say, awesome, thanks, but was surprised with a flesh-colored, wrinkled, phallic-shaped hardware hanging out of his zipper and he just stood there with his hands on his hips so that I knew it didn't just fall out. I turned around back to my computer, and I felt faint. I thought, did that just happen? Without turning back around, I handed him the RTV paper to sign, and he said, see you in a couple of weeks. I took some time in the cage to compose myself and then walked to the manager's office and informed him about the situation. I also called the MOD, they like their acronyms, and his reply was, Well, what do you expect? And then started laughing. Since this was 20 years ago, I'll go ahead and say that I was pretty cute back then. Tan, fit, always had my hair and makeup done. No matter what I looked like, I didn't expect that from someone I had to do business with. The MOD insinuated that I should expect and accept treatment like that from time to time, and they weren't going to do anything about it. I called the company that the hot dog flasher worked for, and they said, uh, we'll look into it. Fast forward a few weeks later, and a co-worker approached me and asked, did you hear? 
That molding dude did the same thing to a cashier. Now he can't come back into the store anymore. So, that son of a bitch didn't get fired? <laughs> Apparently not. Looking back on this whole thing, I should have fucking sued them. I'd probably be rich by now. Maybe I should have just laughed and said, That's all you've got? I've seen bigger ones on newborn babies. But hindsight is always twenty twenty, and the moment I froze, because that was the last thing I ever expected to happen. In eighth grade, my innocence felt like it was taken from me. I was only twelve when the school year began, and I was already accustomed to being more mature than my peers, since I practically raised my four-year-old sister. I had to fulfill parental responsibilities like cooking and cleaning, etc. I also wasn't good at saying no or putting my foot down. Me being too kind caused me problems in my life, which I will mention shortly. There was a special needs boy who I'll call Carl, who attended three of my six daily classes. Whenever anything involved a partner, teachers would always pair me up with Carl. I didn't mind because I disliked how rude my classmates were to him sometimes. It wasn't his fault both he and his twin brother were born with Down Syndrome. He was actually a very nice kid, and always had interesting facts about any given subject. This is where the long history of my stalker experience begins. You see, Carl had a teacher's aide assigned to him. I will call him Matthew. So since I was already partnered with Carl, I decided I would also be friendly towards Matthew as well. This is a decision that I would come to regret. Matthew was 29 at the time. Again, let me remind you that I was only 12. After about three months into the school year, I was getting along great with Matthew and Carl. All was going fine until one of the more popular girls in my grade asked me randomly in front of everyone why Matthew was always touching me. I told her I had no clue what she was referring to, and two other girls chimed in and backed her up, telling me to pay more attention over the next few days. And I did. I started to realize that Matthew always had a hand either on my shoulder or back, sometimes my lower back. This made me extremely uncomfortable because I had never even realized how hands-on Matthew was until now. One day I told him to stop when his hand was way too close to my right breast. This occurred during the final class of the day. My exact words were, Matthew, please don't touch me. It was like if I had cursed his ancestors or something, because he flipped out, pulling away his hand as if I had burnt it. He then waited for the teacher to walk in, then yelled at me in front of everyone. You've changed. You need to grow up. I thought you were different. He then stormed out of the room, almost knocking over the teacher in the process. The teacher followed him outside, and as soon as the door shut behind him, everyone turned their head towards me and asked me what I had done to set him off like that. I told him exactly what I said to Matthew. Even Carl, who saw the whole thing, defended me. What I had least expected was even the popular girls in my class took pity on me. They said if I got into trouble because of this, they would say something to the teachers. The teacher came back in and asked me what happened, and I told her what transpired. The teacher wouldn't believe me, even though I had never given her problems before and was always a straight-A student. That day was the first of many awful days to come. Matthew began demanding why I had changed so abruptly, and started trying to pretend nothing had happened, and proceeded to still touch my shoulders and back. I stood my ground every time, especially since my classmates were there to back me up. Eventually, it escalated to where he would randomly wait for the teacher to walk in, and then start yelling at me. Even during lunch, he would go looking for me on the campus and try to talk to me. It was all very awkward having to deal with him, 
How he managed to become a teacher's aide is beyond me. I began hanging out with the other staff in the office to get away from this unhinged weirdo. He attempted his harassment there, until the front desk lady noticed that I was visibly uncomfortable and even overheard me telling him not to touch me. She immediately hauled ass to get him away from me, and from that point on, the office was a safe area. The straw that broke the camel's back was the day that I struggled to pack all of my things into my school bag so I wouldn't be stuck alone in the classroom with Matthew. He took advantage of my predicament and cornered me in the back of the classroom. I failed to mention this before, but Matthew was six foot four. I was mortified and tried to scream, but because of my panicked state, I couldn't. Matthew glared at me and placed his hands on my shoulders. Before he could say anything, there came a voice from the doorway. Hey, what's going on back there? I then took that opportunity to book it out of there. The next day, my science teacher asked me what happened. She had her detention slip waiting for me, but wanted to hear my side of the story first. I told her that Matthew had been touching me, and I wanted him to stop, and no one seemed to be doing anything about it. She saw that I was visibly shaken and on the verge of tears, and then said the only reason that she wasn't going to give me detention was because she wanted me to return to my old self. Not because of what I told her about Matthew. I was beyond belief at this point. I had told multiple members of the school staff about what Matthew had been doing, and none of them were doing a damn thing about it. They wanted to sweep it under the rug and pretend that everything was just fine. This continued on for months, and yet not one teacher did anything to defend me. My grades began to slip. I went from a straight-A student to an average C. My parents were furious at me when my report card came in. I finally broke down and tried to tell my dad the truth, but he wasn't having any of it and slammed the door to his room in my face. I then went to my mom and told her everything that was happening at school. Finally, an adult listened to what I was saying, and my mom hauled ass to the school the next day and raised hell. They immediately escorted her to the principal's office. I'm not sure what happened from there, but from what my mom mentioned, she got into a screaming match with the principal about my situation, and some of the staff members came forward and backed up my character. Before all this started happening, I didn't have the reputation of being a problematic student. Unfortunately, Carl was removed from all of my classes. I heard stories from some of the other students that Matthew would belittle and reprimand Carl whenever he failed at an assignment. Matthew's conduct eventually caught up with him, and he was ultimately fired. He did the same thing to another female student, and it became impossible to ignore. Matthew disappeared for about a year after that. I remember one day that I was shopping at the local mall with my father when out of the corner of my eye, I saw Matthew crouching behind something, trying to do his best to stay out of sight. The sight of him freaked me out, and I began telling my dad frantically that I was being stalked. However, by the time that my dad went to go investigate, Matthew had vanished. Fast forward to my junior year. My mom was part of an adult soccer team, and I would sometimes go and watch them play. During one of her matches, one of her teammates brought along a person to spectate. It had been a couple of years since I last saw Matthew. But once I made eye contact with this man, there was no mistake. It was him. I wanted the ground to swallow me whole the moment I recognized him. I quickly excused myself and hauled ass out of there. Thank goodness my dad and a bunch of other people were there or Matthew might have just picked up where he left off years before. A couple of years went by. It was now the fall semester of my second year in college. I had pretty much moved on from Matthew at this point, and was making progress and trusting adults again. One day I was heading to class when I noticed a group of men lounging in the quad area of the campus. As I got closer, I froze in place 
because one of the men looked very familiar to me. When we made eye contact, there was no doubt in my mind that it was Matthew. I quickly rushed past, hoping that I was just seeing old ghosts. However, I would not be so lucky. The stalking began again. Matthew would circle me like a shark wherever I went. Whenever I would look out an adjacent window during class, he would be standing somewhere off in the distance, looking directly at me. Whenever I found myself walking down a hallway alone, a chill would creep up my spine. I would look behind me, and there he was, peeking out at me from around the corner. One day, he followed me into the cafeteria and methodically sat at a table next to me. Thankfully, I was with a group of friends. He began eating a slice of half-eaten pizza someone left behind and was staring directly at me the whole time, like some kind of animal. I discreetly called for security, and as soon as they arrived, I pointed right at Matthew and told him that this man had been stalking and harassing me. Matthew spit out the pizza and then bolted through an exit door before campus security could confront him. I was embarrassed because everyone in the cafeteria stopped what they were doing to see what was happening. An investigation into Matthew was launched and the security footage of him roaming the halls corroborated my story and helped me build a case against Matthew to finally get a restraining order against him. Unfortunately, Matthew disappeared once again and I haven't seen him since that day in the cafeteria. I'm grateful that he's gone, but at the same time, I'm not. Because not knowing what he's up to now is driving me crazy. He could be stalking someone else for all I know. That's a terrifying thought. I wish many times over that I had never befriended Matthew all those years ago. I'm now 24, and I have moved hundreds of miles away from my hometown. If anyone listening is being harassed or stalked, don't wait until it's too late. We all deserve to enjoy our lives carefree from any kind of harassment. I hold no resentment towards those who struggle to tell their story. But this entire ordeal took a toll on my mental health and has made it difficult for me to trust anyone. I'm always looking over my shoulder wherever I go, and I've switched to online-only classes to avoid being on campus. Since I've moved away, I've tried my best to move on. However, I use this experience to teach children the importance of speaking up. Believe me, I know it's hard to even think straight in the heat of the moment, but the more you stay silent, the more the problem will grow and damage you in ways that you can't even fathom. I'm a 17-year-old male from England. When this took place, I was 16, and it was December of last year. Me and my mates live in a small village located about 20 miles south from Manchester. Two minutes on the train from us was a larger village, which we would frequently visit as we attended school there. And there was also more stuff to do. Our small village didn't really offer much for a bunch of amped up 16 year olds. There was this old abandoned office building in the larger village that was about a 5-10 to 10 minute walk from the village center where all the shops were. The old office building was quite creepy to look at at night. Each floor was the same, a huge office space to the right of a staircase leading to the back stairwell. To the left were the toilets and various other side rooms. We would sneak in through a broken window that we would then cover up so no other people would know that we were in there. Once in the building, the first thing we did was go up on the roof and get a bird's eye view of the village below. One night, me and three of my friends decided to play a game of hide and seek in the old building. The rules were that the seekers had to count on the roof and give the hiders at least five minutes before coming down to look for them. After several rounds and changing up teams a couple of times, one friend and I decided that it would be a good plan to hide near the ladder. So when the seekers came down, we would discreetly climb up and hide out on the roof. After successfully making our way up to the roof without being seen, we stayed up there for about a half hour, 
The two seekers eventually got bored of looking for us and came to the roof, where we jumped out and scared them for a laugh. How long have you guys been up here? One of them asked. I kept saying that we had been up there the whole time. He looked at me, confused, but didn't say anything else. I thought nothing of it. So we decided to play one more game before heading out. It was now our turn. We started the timer, and the former seekers descended the ladder. Once five minutes passed, we began our search. Once we got to the top of the stairs, I looked through one of the big main offices where you could see the back stairs, and I saw one of the hiders walking down them. I thought that I would be sneaky and go down the main stairs and cut them off. But when I got there, they were gone. Fifteen minutes later, me and my partner were getting bored and a bit creeped out. We knew that they were somewhere in the building because we kept hearing footsteps, doors closing, and what sounded like things being dropped on the floor. We decided to cheat and FaceTimed one of the hiders. When my friend picked up, we were mortified to see Christmas lights outside the building. They had ditched us, and whatever we were hearing wasn't our friends. We immediately hung up and looked at each other before hauling ass out of there. After meeting back up with the other two, they went on to say that to get back at us for outsmarting them, they thought it would be funny to leave us in the building knowing someone else was definitely in there with us. After calming down because I was utterly pissed off at them, we then all talked about what we saw. My friend explained that when they were trying to find us, they both saw someone on the back stairwell and also heard people talking. They began hearing doors opening and closing and what sounded like random things falling to the floor. When they both realized that we were actually on the roof, that's when they decided to leave and play a prank on us. I responded by telling them that I also saw a figure on the back stairs and how we also heard the exact same things that they did. To this day, I still have no idea what was in there with us. We had been in that building several times before and never had that problem. Thinking that for hours on end, we were playing hide and seek, unaware that something or someone was in there with us, makes me feel sick. The building was demolished a month after this happened, and they plan on replacing it with a housing development. So this has to be the strangest thing that I have ever experienced. At the time, it was very unsettling. I'm from the Bristol area in the southwest region of the United Kingdom. Back in July of 2001, I was working my first job at a local department store while studying for my final GCSE exams. I was 16 at the time. I used my pitiful first month's wages to buy my first mobile phone, a Nokia 3210. At first, everything was pretty normal, and I was enjoying the novelty of communicating while on the move and sending short messages, etc. That was until I started getting random missed calls from the future. I would get these bizarre missed calls, either during my shift or just before it started. When I checked the details, I got the same date and time on every occasion. One missed call, no number, December 31st, 2049. New Year's Eve, nearly 50 years into the future, when I would be 66. These calls always came from a quote, no number. It didn't say unknown number, it said no number. That was unusual, even for cell phones in the early 2000s. Most people I tell this story to try to rationalize this by saying, oh, the phone date was just set incorrectly. But I proved this wrong by showing them that the phone was displaying the correct date. I would have chalked this up to a one-off glitch if it had happened only once, but I lost count after this happened at least 13 times over the space of a month. On the 11th time it happened, I caught the call as it was ringing. When I picked up, I heard a bunch of garbled alien-like noises, 
It was almost like the chirping and whirling of an old dial-up modem, only much more advanced and organic sounding. Unfortunately, it was too fuzzy and distorted to make anything else out. I've tried searching forums, chat rooms, and various other websites for a few years afterward, looking for any kind of rational explanation, but I found nothing. The call stopped around December of 2001, but the creepiest thing was that every time I missed the call, a strange sensation came over me, like I was being watched very closely. No one was ever in close proximity to me when I found out that I had missed a call. I remember trying to take photos of the screen as evidence, but it was somehow never visible in all the pictures I took in any light. Remember, 20 years ago, we didn't have cameras built into phones, and screenshots weren't a thing either. So what do you think? Was it a random error, or was it my future self trying to warn me about something? Could it have been aliens, or was it some kind of temporal communication technology being tested on me? Or perhaps it was just another glitch in the Matrix. All I know is that it felt very wrong at the time, like I had accidentally stumbled upon something I shouldn't have. There's always a reason to be afraid.